Um, but essentially, in my mind, what I wanted to do was say something about the big picture, which I keep coming back to, because to me, the big picture, wherever you're at with your big picture, helps make sense of the minutiae, you know, what was happening in Greece or Rome or China or the Maya or whoever, all right? So for me, I tend to start with the big picture and then I burrow down because any form of thinking needs to be practical, okay? You need to be able to apply it to things. There's no point otherwise, all right? And the funny thing is about theory is that really it is just sense-making around things you probably already do or half do or, or something like that, unless you're going to specialise in something like history or town planning or something where you be very specific. But before I go on, I should acknowledge country. And, you know, one day I'm going to get really good at this like Gil was. I love that one you did the other day, Gil. Um, but anyway, this is a traditional one. We acknowledge the cubby gubby, cubby cubby gubby gubby people of it's not the Aurora Nation, actually. And the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, okay, I think it's really important and it's becoming more important as we become more conscious of relationships across and through time with cultures for us to recognise the continuing connection to the land that these people have. And, you know, it's just we are so lucky to live in a country like Australia, but it's come at a huge cost. And the thank them, we thank them for protecting this coastline and our ecosystems and so on. We pay our respect to the eldest past and present and extend that to respect to all First Nations people in the present day. To me, this is really important. Um, I've even been hearing Indigenous people saying this is just sort of very floss on the top of things like a saccharin and so on. But I think if we can embrace acknowledgement given that we are non-Indigenous in background, so one or two of you may be, okay, is that we need to do it and mean it. And we need to mean it and practice it. That means linking our thinking across time, for instance, engaging with First Nations peoples, engaging with their culture, engaging with the kind of new thought forms that are coming out of their culture, like the book... Um, the Songlines book that I've cited a number of times across this course, which is an incredible innovation in thinking because they've got a Indigenous woman and a white woman as interlocutors, you could say, talking across and between about things that matter. And they matter to everybody because they're human things. So the big picture. So in a, in a nutshell, this course is about making sense of where we have come from the history bit and to sprinkle a little foresight that's the futures bit that some of you touched on okay into the present to help us engage with broader and brighter futures that's why i asked all my conversationalists what gives you hope what is, you know is at the root of your optimism they're all social actors they're all working in quite visible roles in their communities what is it that keeps them going when so there seems to be so much bad news pouring in on us, right? Would, would you agree with me that, you know, if you just lived on CNN, well, <laughs> you'd be, you know, a basket case emotionally, mentally, probably. Or am I wrong? Maybe I'm just fantasizing because I'm one of those persons who got rid of TV in the 1980s and haven't watched anything since, you know. But I have read books and I do pay attention. So what are the elements of the course? Well, you've got your key reading that's every week comes along. You got me rabbiting on about something, hopefully making some kind of sense, especially after about week four or five or six when you're starting, things are starting to come into focus. That's what I generally find with a course. Okay. I've been keen on historical literacy, T. Carl. You know, what, what matters is, of course, I, all, and you wouldn't be doing history if you didn't love factoids about the past, you know, this Colosseum or whatever it might be, right? We've got to keep growing that. I'm still growing my historical literacy, always more data to play with, okay? And there was the conversation. So that was, that was where I started. When I realised we had to use Canvas this year, when I saw how it was laid out, I was, I've been a teacher since I was, you know, very young. I thought, <laughs> basically. But then I also thought, okay, well, how do I 
carry the spirit of this course and its exploratory nature into this rather straightjackety sort of medium. Okay, uh, those of you who have only experienced Canvas, you you uh, be happy. Um, but you know, with Blackboard, it just uh, and the, and the other things around education that was happening at the uni before that, there was more scope. We were able to have lectures. We were able to engage more directly. Okay. And so that's been important to me to, to come up with a formula. So this is the first time we've run the formula. Give me feedback on it in your CTAC stuff, please. What worked, maybe what you'd like to see done better, what didn't work. That's always really important for me because I do listen and I do pay attention. I'm gonna move this over here. Uh, come on, throw it out over there. All right. Now, it's important to sort of think about the past, not as a real thing. The, the past doesn't exist. So David Staley, who wrote this book, History in the Future and Future. So he's really interesting. He uses historical thinking as a way of doing futures work, interestingly enough. Um, the past is no longer in existence. I just said that, didn't I? Therefore, the historian must create a textual object can anyone suggest to me what a what he means by a textual object? I love it. It could be, yeah. Um, oh, that's it's certainly tactile, but it, there's more to it than that. That you're you're on the right track, and certainly if you go to my place, you'll see a lot of these textual objects lying around. Yeah, yeah, you, you write articles, whatever. The textual object is possibly quite likely a physical thing, like you were suggesting, but it can also be an ebook or whatever. But we use text in history. Historians are very text based. You might have noticed that there are a fair few readings in history, right? It's a readings based course. If you went to Oxford in the 1950s, you would say, oh, I'm reading history. Funny thing is you'd also say, I'm reading mathematics. <laughs> um, because, you know, it, what our culture does is it privileges a certain kind of text, the written word, over other things like DNA or, you know, archaeology or material culture. So we, the historians create a textual object. In other words, they write about the history of Indigenous Australians and, you know, the frontier wars or whatever it might be. We write about it. Okay, and he says, uh, in the same way, really, the future doesn't exist. The history of the future, in order to compensate for the absence of the future itself. So he says it is compensating. We're filling a gap. The only thing that exists in reality, in the physical reality, is the here and now. You guys are sitting there. I'm standing here you know, and, and so on. But we don't exist out of time. We are in a temporal, you know, if you wanted to be posh, you'd say milieu, in a temporal context, past, presents, and futures, folding in on one another. I know that you come from Denmark, okay? Do we have any other people from international backgrounds? Two others, where from? From Denmark as well. Okay, here we go. Aha, you've come to see if this is working. I have no idea if it's working or not. I just put it on because, um, so hang on one minute. We'll just make sure because it is. I wonder why it wasn't before. Everybody witnessed me. So. Test one, two, one, two. Oh, you came down here for nothing. I'm sorry for dragging That's you right. down here. Had a few more tests for my 10,000 today. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Oh, awesome. See you then. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing, our relationship with time. One of the things about, you know, coming from different places is that you're bringing different pasts, different experiences in Maori. Some, yeah, okay. So you, we've got some level of something quite alien to most Western, Western people, okay, unless you've been lucky enough spend time in New Zealand. You've probably not hung out with the, uh, the 
the Sami or something like that, have you? Looking and looking at the two Danes in the room. Okay. You don't even know what I'm talking about. The Sami are the indigenous people north in Scandinavia, a bit north of Denmark, actually. They're more in Sweden and Norway. Okay. And, and across into the Baltic states and like that. But, you know, so we've got different histories in here. Then I would say, how many people are born on the coast? One. You're born on the coast. You just said you're from New Zealand. You can't say you're from here as well. <laughs> okay. No, the coast, meaning the Sunshine Coast. Sorry. <laughs> Did you? Uh, we, yeah, so we got, no, not you. Okay, so we got a bunch of ring ins. How many of you are Mexicans? That means people from the South States. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're Mexicans. Okay. So we've got a bunch of, you're a Mexican too. Okay. So we've got, so we've got people coming in from all over the place. All right. And that's really interesting because each one of us has a unique biographical experience, like a thumbprint or a fingerprint, you know, that makes us unique. So when we come together, this will be the, probably the only time that we individuals will all be in the same room together. All right? It's, it'll be very unlikely just to get the exact same configurations. We've, so we've got a, something magical here. It's a magical relational chemistry. Okay, if we, if we put this away and I shut up and I left you to talk, it's, it's slowly but surely you constellate. You might constellate. Um, according to your disciplines at first, and then you'll find out that two of you, two might find out that you like bushwalking, and other two might like fine arts, and another one likes is a geek about music, you know, and that sort of thing. And we'll start grouping in different ways. So I see this as human coagulation. And when I used to have real classes, you know, you'd see whether they were little kids, because I used to teach primary and secondary as well, you'd see the way people move around. So we create our own little tribes, our own little safety zones, all right? Um, no idea what the lawyer would talk to, but, you know, we might find someone for you to talk to. <laughs> there you go, a good conversation. If you want good conversation, we know where to go. But you, do you understand what I'm saying? So this uniqueness makes of each present something very special. Yeah, Gil? Yeah, Rising in this year, is it literally that we're in the present, which will become the future? So we're rising. So no, what he, it, what he's saying is in future stuff. You know, they talk a lot about images of the future. Okay, so that's the sort of thing. He's this guy is this is from yeah the very beginning of his book, and in his book he's laying out a way that he uses history in workshops to stimulate alternative thinking about futures plural. He's not a futurist, so he doesn't use futures with an S, but he's an historian who's actually discovered that giving alternative histories, looking at, so we, there's something called, um, oh, it's, it's, it was about to pop out of my mouth and it's gone. Um, there's counterfactuals. What happens if Adolf Hitler had won? What happens, what would have happened if he'd won, uh, if, if they had actually got to Moscow and stopped, you know, got the Russians in the headlock before the Russians could fight back? You know your little bit of history about that? Okay. So that's a counterfactual. What he does, he runs counterfactuals for the future. So the history of the Russian-Ukraine conflict is ongoing, he would say. These are, let everybody here, you, you're all kind of informed about it. Let's put it up on the board. What are some of the key elements, the key drivers? Then we're going to say, let's jump 20 years into the future. How will that have played out? Russia wins, Russia loses. Ukraine wins, Ukraine loses. A number of, and we would call them, in my line of work, scenarios. So he's writing, he's getting them to create scenarios of the future. Yeah. 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 It's good. So the anthropological sensibility is very closely aligned to the sociological imagination because 
it's informed by history and context and a whole range of things. The imagination is something that's not privileged a lot in modern education. We're more about managing information and regurgitating and getting right answers. You know that I've said a number of times, I'm not into answers. I'm much more interested in speculative stuff about what might have happened here or how was it to be a soldier in the First World War trenches or whatever it was, to kind of put my imagination as well as I could into an alien space. That's part of what we call the historical imagination. And one of the great writers, uh, historians of the 20th century, Collingwood, R.W. Collingwood, wrote a, a lot about the historical imagination, for instance. So what we're playing with here is taking historical method, which is evidence. You can't, if we got evidence, we can't make it up. You can't say there was no Holocaust or Adolf Hitler, you know, is just a conspiracy, you know, like a conspiracy theorist type thing. You can't do that. Why? Because we have evidence. How do we deal with the evidence? We look at the evidence from multiple causes. We have different ways of questioning the evidence according to what our history is. If you're, a number of you done a few other history courses, history 100, history 200, 210, none of those? You have. Okay. It's very different from this course, right? Yeah. Of course, because its content is different, its lecture is different, and so on. But, you know, History 100 is about, we've got a whole bunch of data, but we're looking at Australian history from a cultural perspective, okay? It's the popular, is it popular culture? Is it just, yeah, it is the pop culture. I think Gil helped me teach it a few years ago. And did you teach in that one too? Good on you. Yeah, because I have, I'm useless on pop culture, I have to admit. Uh, so I'd always look over here and say, yeah, Give me an example of what was that name of that band again or, you know, that sort of stuff. But, you know, the, the point is, is that where you're standing in the historical discipline will determine the kind of questions you ask. And that's really important. We, from a world history, global history, big history perspective, might say, okay, how is energy or complexity or collective learning playing? Oh, what about um, imagined orders or, you know, and so on. I'm going to touch on a number of those things. So that we've got tools to deal with the evidence. Evidence on its own doesn't say anything much, especially if it's material evidence. Let's say you can walk into the Colosseum and say, this is a pretty rundown old building. <laughs> Anybody been to the Colosseum? Okay, yeah. So it is a pretty rundown old building, but you know, it's still awesome. Yeah, but you know, half of it was quarried in the middle ages for <laughs> stones to build churches and so on around Rome, all sorts of stuff happened to it. So when we have a material object in front of us, how do we handle that? As historians, and I'm going to touch a bit more on that, we need a certain kind of historical consciousness, a way of asking questions, a way of interrogating, so that we cannot get an answer answer, but we can offer a powerful interpretation. The readings that I gave you, especially in the first six to seven weeks of the course, are each person giving an interpretation that is kind of unique. They actually, I feel, quite comfortably flow into one another. But you know, I've been doing this for years. For you guys, it's just saying, oh, Harari sees it like this. Christian can see it like this. Graeber and Wengrove see it like this and so on. Okay, so each one is a lens. As you become more skilled at being tertiary students at a university, academic mind, develop, you will start growing at the ability to weave and pick up. I'm always talking about joining the dots. Can you see similarities between that reading and that reading sort of thing? It's really something that you need to start asking yourself because ultimately you're in charge of the, the way you're thinking and your skill sets grow, all right? That's it. So this is, oops, this is my tat. Okay, I should get a chair as well to go next to it. Uh, but, you know, this is, this is my visual image of the flowing of the past, the present and the future. There's no one present. I mean, I talked about it as though there was for us here. But, you know, you're sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? And you're sitting there thinking, oh, this guy can go on. And you're, you're thinking something else, you know, but maybe you're timing, waiting for your next cup of coffee or something else. It really, it doesn't matter too much to me. Those of you who have got your computers open, I often 
think it's funny because, you know, you could be doing Facebook or Twitter or anything on there, okay, watching a Netflix video <laughs> or something and just sort of you're here for the because it's nice and cool as it's hot out there. It, it really doesn't bother me. But what I'm trying to get at is that each one of you brings your own presence. You know, you had conversations, you might have had an argument, you might have had a really, you know, you might have just fallen in love. It really doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to you. But, you know, in terms of our coming together, it means that there's no real one present. There is a present that we share. It's got material qualities. We're in a certain kind of room where you're experiencing a lecture, okay, because you haven't had one, many of you. Hope you're enjoying it. Uh, and, you know, some people would be sitting here. They'd be reading their notes and so on. I, I'm a storyteller. That's the way I've always done things. So I don't use it, but I use these as a sort of palm card type thing. So, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, there is there is shared presence. Like here we are. Our present in this room is not the same present as somebody in an office somewhere else on the campus even. But, you know, as the further we move away from a geographical, historical, temporal context, 21st century, 20, 20, 22, the year in, in Australia, as opposed to in Afghanistan or as opposed to somewhere else, those presence, and there will be lectures going on in Afghanistan, I can tell you, I haven't taught in Afghanistan, but I've taught in India quite a bit. It is so structured trying to get um, somebody to put their hand up like you just did is unheard of almost um, because it's such a hierarchical approach. You know, uh, modern Western education tends to be much more egalitarian in some respects, but you still know I can pass or fail you, right? So you're always a little bit careful. Mostly save your venom for the in a CTAC thing where you can go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, the, the point is that we have a shared presence. We've got a planetary presence, present, that's singular, but it's, it, we've got to understand that the singular it doesn't exclude the multiple and the multiple doesn't exclude the singular. Does that make sense? Okay. So really, am I making sense to you guys over here? He's a town planner. He gets those sorts of things. I'm looking at you. Yeah, you're all okay? You, stop me if I say something that you want expanded on or explained a bit because I'll just keep on chucking because I'm having fun. I've got an audience. <laughs> okay. What I wanted to look at here was one of the things about historical stuff was we tend to see things as a trajectory. So urban planners were like this. We've got Gobekli Tepe, then we've got the Colosseum, then we've got Shanghai, and then we've got solar punk up here. I'm, I'm quite in love with solar punk at the moment. I keep reading their stuff. It's just one way of visualizing the future in an optimistic way. All right. But what we've got here is something quite special. We've got a story in, of energy management, complexity, collective learning can be shown here. This is a history of the future. This one, it's a, you know, uh, you, you know about solar punk or should I explain that just a little bit? Bah, bah. Okay. You've heard of cyberpunk? Okay, well, solar punk was a reaction to the grimness of cyberpunk. Okay, so what they've done is they it's still a love affair with technology, but it's bringing much more into the kind of narratives around technology, futures technology, uh, environment. Okay, so you've got a lot of green stuff happening here, you've got a mother and child having a picnic or whatever. We've got these. This is almost that, like out of uh, Studio Ghibli stuff, you know, uh, Nausicaa and those Japanese things from the 1990s and 20 odd years ago. You know, that's the sort of thing they had there. So they were possibly, they were sort of more cyberpunky in some of their images, but sometimes they were solar punky. But solar punk is now producing literary genres, okay, short stories, songs, along with the visual. So essentially, it's a form of imagining the future that's not stuck in, we're all doomed. Essentially, that they're offering an evolutionary way out, perhaps, or way forward. 
something, because if we think we're doomed, it has a very negative impact on our sense of what we will choose to do, what, how we experience our own agency, in other words, our own ability to act. Yeah, does that make sense? So solar punk, go and look it up. Um, see if you can track down some literature. There's magazines dedicated to it that are online so you don't have to pay for the thing. I've got a couple of books. Uh, particularly they've, they've been focusing, solar punk writers particularly, been focusing on urban spaces in the last five to ten years, which is really interesting from your perspective. Um, but yeah, at the same time, they're, they're more looking at optimal futures. But really, I just wanted to put this slide up because I wanted to say, okay, Human beings, for the last, that was 12,000 years ago, roughly, Gobekli Tepe. It wasn't a lived-in site. It was a sacred site around which there must have been huts or communities gathering in some way. Um, so that was more like a, a massive temple. And there's a lot of interesting speculative work going on with archaeologists and so on around Gobekli Tepe. This is, of course, Rome at its height, Vespasian around 75 to 85 or whatever, built that. It was finished by and opened by his son. Shanghai, just a, a, the, one of the archetypal mega cities on the planet today. So we can see that energy is being marshaled to generate those three spaces. It's also represented here just by the wind turbines and, and so on. Then we've also got complexity. The agricultural uh, stuff that was going on with Gobekli Tepe is really, really interesting. Has anybody, because I know I've mentioned this before in the lectures, did any of you go off and look at Gobekli Tepe? For your presentation, your Pecha Kucha? That's right. So it's strange. So what that the some of the archaeologists are thinking is that at least in this case, we can't generalise from that to the entire planet or anything, but it seems that large numbers of people, a broad community over probably a few hundred square kilometres, started expressing their religiosity, spirituality, whatever you want to call it, through a site like a Bekle Tepe, which they built. And coming together, they needed some form of organisation, but you needed to feed people, right? So how did they do that? they started developing agriculture. A lot of them, a number of archaeologists are also thinking that it was, the agriculture was also to support ritual processes that were happening in Gobekli Tepe. Um, for instance, there's, and there's been a, it, it picked up on a speculation that predates the work on Gobekli Tepe, where there's been a, a tussle between, we started growing things because we wanted food, in response to the shift in the planetary weather systems, or we started growing grains because we wanted to ferment them and get blind drunk. <laughs> so the, the idea is, and it, it's, it's well, form, both are well formulated and there's evidence for both. It's possible that at di in different times, different places, we had both happening. We don't know because, of, and that's the one wonderful thing. You don't have to know. You can be speculative, speculative and curious about it. That's really what matters more to me, at least. So, so how do we read the past? Well, these are the first six weeks, really. Yeah, six weeks, all right? So we can take the David Christian Energy Collective Learning and Complexity one, which you said was useful and made total sense to you. Imagined orders, that means, well, what was happening in Gopepe Tepe? How come the Romans built a Colosseum? Okay. What kind of order does the Colosseum represent? Well, if you knew the way people sat in the Colosseum, it was the poor people sat furthest away and the senators. So it was a way of stratified class and, and wealth distributions and so on. The Romans were colorblind. You could be black uh, from southern sub-Saharan Africa. You could still be a Roman. But they were very aware of who had the sesterces or not. You know, that, that's that was what really mattered in the Roman world. So the imagined order is represented by the architecture, by the way that the community was structured and designed and so on. That was one. That was a spatial reference. But there are other references. What did they believe? Well, the Romans' pantheon of gods 
kind of represented Roman structured society again. You know, had Zeus and, and not Zeus, um, Jupiter at the top and so on. So, you know, you, you had that sort of thing. Jupiter was more powerful than Hera. So the male dominance, the gender stuff was there, that sort of stuff. You understand? You two are snickering out the back. Oh, sorry, that's right, Juno. I'm, I'm getting my cultures mixed up. Thank you. So, and um, so on. An imagined order is a mythic order. There's no reason why our world should be the way it is, other than the fact that it is this way. Capitalism doesn't have to be as exploitative as it is. There are different forms of capitalism. I, when I first started chatting with Ida, you know, I was reflecting on how it felt different when I got to Sweden, where I do a reasonable amount of work, or Denmark. It's, it's not the same sort of social structure as you get in an Anglo-Saxon Anglo world. In, in ways that are almost imperceptible if you're not looking. I'm always looking because that's what I'm trained to do as much as anything. So there's different kinds of capitalism. China is a capitalist country, but it's hegemonic, one party, uh, communist, and so on. But it still has a very high-powered capitalist economy. So capitalism isn't a one-size-fits-all. That goes for almost anything that you can look at. Can you think of an example yourself? Can you all come up with an example? You can chat, you can let us know if you want or just think of it. What kind of thing, what is something that you take for granted in your world that uh, might be changing or could change or could be changed just like that? This is the sort of question that you can ask yourself. It's, it's a powerful question because it frees you from the grip of a present, okay? It really can liberate you. So that's what Harari is on about with his imagined orders. Human webs, you know, classic world history stuff. Human webs of people interacting across space more than time, sharing goods, sharing knowledge, and so on. The idea of domestication and who domesticated who is very, very interesting. How, how many of you enjoyed that reading from Bregman, yeah? So what, what, what was it, you kind of almost smiling, so what was it about the Bregman reading that appealed to you? When I started reading it, I was like, this is interesting. I read it yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah, I read it. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the narration for once, but I thought the whole idea about, you know, domesticating the silver fox but then how we are actually, you know, way further back we've been kind of domesticated. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So, yeah, he says, look, we might think if it was this, if really survival of the fittest was the way things worked, it would be the survival of the smartest. But he says, no, it's survival of the friendliest, which is what you're saying. So why? Because the friendliest, the puppy, the cute puppy, that all of us go, oh, you know, <laughs> we'll, we'll take that home and it will become a partner in our life. The species has a way forward because it's got secure food, it's safe, and so on. It doesn't have to go and rip the throat out of, you know, the closest bunny rabbit or something like that. Uh, though I had a dog who would do that if she ever had half the chance. Um, so, um, but, you know, the, the idea is that our relationship with the world we inhabit co-produces who we are that's the ultimate lesson that we co-evolve all right and that's really important to understand that we don't we're not just absolute single little units of course we can say yeah i can see that my parents influence my values either positively or negatively um so on yes absolutely where, who, who doesn't have a smartphone on them at the moment? All right. So we're all anchored through our smartphones, our smart devices. Um, it's, it's, it's everything, you know. I virtually go nowhere without wearing blue jeans. I just have been wearing them for the last 45 years. I don't see why I should change my <laughs> habits now. Um, that sort of thing. So there are, there are certain things like that as well. So 
And that's, co- that's called object-oriented ontology. That's where me and, and my being, my identity, is linked to the objects that I surround myself with and that I interact with. Yeah, it extends me. And in fact, that's a really interesting one. One of the things we used to do in my History 100 courses, you wouldn't be doing it in the one you just done, is looking at the prosthetic. You know what a prosthetic is? Okay. Looking around, make sure everybody knows what a prosthetic is. Okay, so my glasses are here. My glasses are here. They extend my ability to see. Most technology extends our ability to do something. The pen, that's right. The pen extends my ability to communicate. It's it's easier. It's the smart devices extend your ability to communicate and so on. So all technologies amplify something that humans do or want to do. That amplification is part of global history. It's part of world history. Really, it, it, the, you can't go anywhere once you start seeing the world like this without going, oh, yeah, oh, look at that. And you can't even, you know, look at your boy or girlfriend or parents or whatever. You're, the, the way you see everything starts to shift, okay? And, you know, this is a key driver in that, that I can't believe you guys are still sitting there. 12.30, I'm just looking at how long you've just sat still. You let me stand up here rabbiting on, okay? We're so domesticated. This is the product, successful product of school indoctrination for one and a half to two decades of your life, depending on when you got incarcerated, I mean, you got enrolled in schools, okay? And, you know, we've convinced your parents that they're being bad parents if they don't send you to school. And I, I'm, I, I'm not a fan of schools, though I've worked in them, um, but I've worked in reasonably feral schools where you can do almost anything you like. And they, they're quite different. There was Montessori School over the road, 1990s, early 20s. I think they moved in about 2006, 2007 to their current site. There's the River School. I've taught in the yogic schools, all sorts of different schools, so that I can experiment with different forms of human chemistry. How do we learn? How do we become? How do we co-create and, and domesticate not ourselves in a really that negative sense, but how do we find some inner discipline, but build around our own passions. So it's really important, you know. Let's keep moving. Indigenous memory and voice. Well, that's the um, thinking. I was thinking particularly about that fantastic reading from when, uh, Graeber and Wengro, um, where we're, he's, they're looking, it's they, they're looking at the way that the in, Indigenous memory has informed Western thinking without us ever acknowledging it. It's a really interesting one. They, they're talking about the Enlightenment guys who um, were hearing from others who'd gone to North America about interactions with Indigenous people in, in North Americans. And the, the way that they reflected back to Westerners, the colonialists, the flaws in their own society. Very, very interesting. But this is going on. This is an ongoing project. There are a lot of great Māori people working in that space. There are Indigenous Australians working in that space. It's a way of reclaiming, but also remembering. That's why I put the remembering. How do we reconnect? How do we re-belong? Okay. How do we come back as members of a on an equal footing in a world which is deeply stacked you know, against certain peoples? Okay. Very interesting. And then I, I love the weird guy. I mean, the weird guy is just hilarious, but he's also clever. I mean, he's he's got a lot of research behind him. What does weird stand for again? Anyone able to tell me without going to your notes? Democratic, that's it. Yes. So these are things that have changed the way the human, Western human brain works. It's given us short-term advantage. Very interesting to see that that short-term advantage is now flipping, you know, because we've got China, vastly wealthy India, we've got non-Western countries that are now playing the same game. That's going to lead to some form of cultural evolution, but 
you know, the educated particularly, the tech space and so on, uh, you know, if you if you got really carried away with the book and you sort of rush off, because I can never stay with just a chapter you have to read from these books. I'm always jumping backwards and forwards trying to sort of give you a, a fuller picture, you might say, without you having to go to do the reading. But if you read the introduction, for instance, to that book, uh, you get a really interesting picture into the neurobiology of human evolution and how that links up very much with domestication and, and advantage, the evolutionary advantage. So these are different ways. These are lenses. I use the term lens like, a, you know, a, 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 a magnifying glass, you know, like that. You know, different ways of looking at the past. It's really important to understand that every time you pick up a historian, you're getting a slightly different perspective. Why? Because their perspective is unique. It grows out of their own growth. And, of course, what we're ultimately looking for is you to develop your own perspective. So that's where we're going. So I've rabbited on a, uh, in the lectures a little bit about deep time. Can anyone tell me what I mean? What's, what, what do you think deep time means? Say that again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crossing vast stretches of time, isn't it? But being aware of how that informs who we are, really important to be aware. So deep time is about temporal consciousness, you could say. The temporal is what fascinates historians. I mean, it's, it's just study of the past, right? And, you know, there are different points in the past that we could go back to. So, Amber, what you, you have a favourite part of the past, don't you? You confessed in, in the treat. I can't remember what it was, though. Visual art, that's it, yeah. So, and you had images in your Pichacucha from the Renaissance through to Picasso, was it? No, it wasn't Picasso. It was, um, I know the one, I, I know the painting because I've seen it. Sorry? Oh, the, the, that's the Renaissance, yeah, from, yeah from, from the early period. But anyway, the thing is that, so you're, if, have you ever looked at the cave paintings of south of France, north of Spain? Okay, because art has a much deeper temporal zone than that. So, but the point is that each one of you are probably, I would assume, I could be wrong, fascinated with some point in the past. So you two are snickering about me getting Juno mixed up with Hera. Maybe both of you are Greek myths and, and Roman myth geeks. I, I don't know. But, you know, that's, it's, it's a good thing to be geekish about. I've been, I've been through my Greek and Roman myth geeky stage. And I'm still partly there because you never leave these things behind, of course. Um, so deep time. Here is the Big Bang captured in one of those lovely graphics you find on the internet. So when we look at time, though, as historians, as I talked about earlier, we need data. We need to be able to anchor ourselves in, you know, with elements that make sure that they, we stay true to the um, to the material reality of a past that's still existing in remnants. Wreckages of the past are in the present. The Colosseum is a wreckage from the past in the present. It was for four or five centuries the absolute centre of civic activity in Rome. That's a long time. Australia was so-called colonised just over two and a half centuries ago. It's twice as long as Australia has been colonised. This place, if you, if you think about Delphi, going off to the Greeks and their myths, you know, in, in Greece, it, it was running for one and a half to 2,000 years in some form as a sanctuary up until, you know, it was officially closed by one of the Christian Roman emperors at the end of, you know, like 400 uh, of the Common Era or something like that. Think about Egypt. Egyptians, I was really, I didn't know this, one of Ramesses, or Ramesses the second, Ramesses the Great. Have you heard of him? The the uh, pharaoh who put his uh, the famous statues of, that he built down in New uh, Numidia, which is now whatever the country is called. I forget now. Uh, where they put they built the Aswan Dam and they had to move the the statues up. 
one of his sons went around renovating ancient buildings. Uh, they were ancient to him because they were one and a half thousand years old. So he was renovating. He was like, he, this guy that I was talking to was the, the first archaeologist, <laughs> really interested in ancient Egyptian archaeology. That's right, who was the next in line to be Pharaoh, except he died because people died a lot easier back then. Okay, there's a paradox here, of course. So we've got the data and we have to use our imagination to cross time. The paradox is what? We need objective data, but we need an imaginative emotional connection. That's one of the reasons why I talked about curiosity at the very beginning of this course. Curiosity is an emotion. It's not just something that happens in your head. It's something that, and, and it's hard to explain. You know, I've watched kids much of my working life, but I also have kids. And so I've been, one might be obsessed with a stick insect. Another one might be obsessed with marbles and Lego, you know. It's really, and you can't explain that through sort of the rational. It's more that each individual is attracted to different things. Many people aren't doing history at this university. They're doing boring things like law, you know. <laughs> but if they uh, or town planning, <laughs> to me, that would be pretty boring too. But okay. that's to me, not to you. You see, that's the whole point. And I've got my youngest son is a nerd. He, he talks to me about programming the whole time. And I just have to pretend that I know what he's talking about. So it's funny to see those totally different dimensions of the personal. but. You've got to acknowledge and you've got to foster and grow. If you put energy into your emotional and imaginative connections to the past or to the futures for that matter, we're growing a passion. You've got to nurture it. Sometimes people tell me that they loved history at school, that they loved history when they were young, but then they had to, they became a bank clerk or something for the next 40 years, looked out their family, and then they come back at the 50 or 60 to what they loved. That's a, that, that means the whole center of their life is empty and it's just more duty. Okay, don't be like that, if you don't mind me saying. Okay, so if we're thinking deep time, this goes back to what you were saying, we're all stardust. Carl Sagan, I love that guy. I think he's a fantastic uh, representative of how to think big, you know, how to be larger than life in your own life. Doesn't mean that you're larger than life, you know, in, in the community that you're in, but you carry something, an awareness that at the Big Bang, all of us were there. We were cheering. Okay. And ultimately it spatters out here. And then of course we'll all be dead sooner or later and we'll compost and we'll go back. But the matter that is us will still be here. That's important to remember. So that's why I say that they are intimate. We, if we take the past, the presence, and the futures intimately, it means I have a relationship with the trees, I have a relationship with the stars, big bangy stuff, as well as with the microbes and the mycelium and all these other things that are growing under the ground. Okay, so I'm going to stop after this one. I'm a bit early, but this is sort of like I think this is because I, I wanted to talk about big picture things first. All right. So these are things that I think historians should do, should in brackets, it should is one of those terrible words, you should be a good girl, you know, <laughs> like that. No, no, it's not that sort of thing. This is the sort of stuff that, you know, uh, we're trying to cultivate in you guys. Evidence, and there's an ethics to it. You can't lie. You can't leave out the bit of evidence you don't like. We can't force it to fit in some way, okay? It's really important. We've got, we're a part of a community. So we see what others have found and said. That's one of the reasons why we do, did that Pecha Kucha presentation. So you could show Gil or Caitlin or myself and your peers, hopefully some showed up, you know, you could show them what turned you on and how you saw some of the things that we've touched on. But, you know, as an academic, I'm writing an article, I send it off. It gets blind, peer-reviewed, comes back to me. They might say terrible things. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they say fantastic. Sometimes they don't say much at all. But then it gets published and it goes out into a world where people are reading it. Some people like it. Some people don't. 
every one of those on the list that I gave you, you know, the weird, the imagined orders, David Christian, they all have really staunch critics and they also have staunch followers. So we're in a world that's democratic to some extent, but, you know, at the same time, it's dialogical. We don't exist as separate units, though we might bring our unit biology and biography into a, any context like this. It's interesting as a dance going on there. We have to acknowledge our own position. We have to confess, I actually, you know, and like that, whether it's I'm an Indigenous writer or I am a person of alternative genders, I'm, a, I'm an old white guy, <laughs> you know, who's a baby boomer. You can all blame me, all right? Gil is not a baby boomer, by the way. No. <laughs> yeah, he's, he likes that liminal space. <laughs> but you know. That's right. So the point is that we have to confess where we are. We have to say these are the, and also we have to say these are the things that impassion me. I'm passionate about education. I'm passionate about the past and the future. I'm passionate about exploring things haptically, in other words, through my body. I don't, you know, I don't like to write just about this stuff. I like to go and, you know, I've walked around ancient Israel through Jerusalem. I've walked around these places. And wherever I am, my all my senses are out but they're cultural senses we don't just have physical senses they we have cultural ones you can feel places and they feel quite different so this is where you have to confess something about who you are evident and sure so the evidence is presented whole and not skewed or cherry picked in other words i like that bit but not that bit that's the um, if you do history 300 with me we do we look at a couple of people who represent the cherry picking style the most famous one is a guy called David Irving who denied the Holocaust, okay? Um, he, we have to acknowledge paradox. That means that you can have two, two things that seem to be right, agriculture or worship or beer and <laughs> agriculture or whatever it might be, right? And so we've got that sort of thing. There's tension there, but it's up to us as scholars to make sense of that tension, to actually give it some form where we don't resolve it, but where we give element insights into how it's working to create the kind of narrative that you're offering about whatever. Okay? So that's really important. And if we interpret with a constructed edifice of evidence. In other words, you take that bit, that bit, that bit, that bit, and you put it all together. One of the things that interests me the most about books like Harari's book, um, Homo sapiens, no, Sapiens, sorry, not Homo, or the one from Graeber and Wengro, the big fat one. I don't know if you went and looked at it on, um, I can't even remember the title right now. But the way they use evidence is very, very interesting. It's scholarly, it's well referenced, really well referenced. And, and talking about well referenced, one of the, I was in my other course, I've been talking, waxing eloquent about a historian called Mary Beard, who does this wonderful stuff on Rome. She's just, well, a few years ago now, produced a book called Laughter in Ancient Rome, which is a study of what made Romans laugh. She's got 60 pages of footnotes and references. Yeah, you know, that's, that's how thorough she is as a scholar. But she, the way she writes, it's, it's like she's talking to you. Admittedly, she's talking to you in a rather structured and uh, academic sort of way, but it's very accessible. Interesting. So this edifice of evidence is important. And if you're going to hazard a guess at something, why might this happen? Be explicit. Don't say this is the truth. Say my best guess is or whatever. You, you understand what I'm trying to say? So that's really important. So if you've got all of that under your belt, yeah, so I'll stop there. I just needed to check that. We'll have a five-minute break, something like that. Go and do some push-ups, squats, you know, do something energetic because I'm looking at you all and you're just sitting there going. So that's the, that's the downside to lectures. You get this kind of... <laughs> Last time. Deep time. As a Professor Brian Cox last oh, Friday. Yeah. You were there. He's an amazing guy, isn't he? He's yeah. like a rock star. Yeah, yeah. And he has a comedian with him, so he makes it funny. Yeah. Did you see who's the Australian guy? 
long hair, Tim Minchin. Oh, Tim, Cox yeah. and Minchin do a fantastic thing. It's on YouTube somewhere. Oh, You're running away. Yes, I thought it should be on Canvas. Can you email me and remind me? Sure. All right, do Thank that. You. Sorry, so you did quite well. I'm not <laughs> for sure. Ah. In the slides, uh, I've got a PDF of this book, which you might be interested in having a look at. Sorry? Oh, that's, she, it, it's so good. <laughs> it's like consummate historian at work, you know, it's just so good. Yeah. Straight the jokes. Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's it's not, it's more like, um, I mean, she she talks about things that they, the way they, they had fun and laughed, but it's not so much about the, what it was Roman humour, it's actually the biophysiology of what made Romans laugh. It's very, very interesting. She's got, she starts off with two examples, one from a play by Horace and the other one is from a, an anecdote from an Cassius Dio, a historian, a Roman historian from the second, third century of the Common Era. And when Dio was a young guy, they had that horrible um, emperor, Commodus or Commodus. He's the guy from the gladiator who is the horrible guy there. Um, dies a different way. The gladiator is quite theatrical. But Commodus was very happy to kill people, you know, any, any old time. So, and you had to attend, especially if you're from the senatorial ranks, which Dio was, had to attend these shows that he put on in the Colosseum. They'd sit right down the front, of course, because they were the rich, wealthy ones. And they had to sit there for two, three, four hours while Commodus dressed up as Hercules or whoever it was, ran around, you know, spearing hippopotami. Right. Yeah, that sort of thing. Oops. And oh, you found is that, it. Is that the one where they're doing the updated version of the other stuff? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's terrific. <laughs> um, so Commodus it wants to intimidate those senators. So he he in one of his acts he decapitates an ostrich. And he picks up the ostrich head like that and he walks over with his blood all over his sword, dressed up as Hercules, and just glares or smirks at these senators. But they all start to laugh. But if you if you if they if Commodus knew that they were laughing at him, he would have killed them. So they all had to come up with they so he Cassius Dio got them all to start chewing laurel leaves, which are really bitter. <laughs> And to so she talks about it that sort of incident. So what is it when you get those giggles that you just can't suppress? And she talks about the word giggle and say, well, that's a very female. It's gendered, you know. So the Romans talk use this word. Yes, that's right. So it, so it's not a giggle in the way that we use that word now. The chortle. Uh, the chortle. Yes, I was wondering what the masculine might be. Chortled in his joy. Yeah, yeah. Come to my arms, my beamish boy. He chortled in his joy. Yeah. yeah. Getting the giggle. But it's also a young. Yeah. There wasn't sort of any idea about that. It was just about Because the young are feminized. That's true. Anyway, I'm just waving that book at Gil. I'm going to be looking at it soon. But I put up, I found that it's available um, as an ebook oh, yes. through uh, as a PDF. So I put the PDF Where is that? Uh, under under these slides on the page very soon. Oh.
So we'll wait for our lawyer to come back and the two guys there. It's, a, it's the snippets that I've read have I've really enjoyed. I found them great. So we'll wait just to see if those guys come back and then I'll start. Is there anything that's popped into your minds going out, wandering around or whatever that you, you'd like me to expand on before I move on to the next phase? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Westernized. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, more we're more weird as a planet now than as a culture. Or is, there's a planetary culture. Part of being a global citizen is being weird. It is. I mean, we might not want to admit it, but the idea of global citizenship is still politically shaded. What is a citizen? It's a member of a city. It means that people who are not in the city are less than the people who are in the city. You know, that goes right back to ancient times. Um, democracy. Do we have a democracy, really? <laughs> How does democracy work? You know, there's more than one kind of democracy. North Korea is a democracy, if you look at its full name. So was East Germany. You remember East Germany? It was, you know, the, the so socialist, democratic, blah, 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 of Germany or whatever it was. I forget how they called it, but yeah. So here. All right. So one of my favourite Australian historians is a guy called Tom Griffith. He wrote a book called The Art of Time Travel. Early on, this is only page nine, he says, history is so important, it's everywhere, it's ubiquitous, so integrated with our public and personal lives, that's why I said it's intimate, right, uh, that it is possible to take it for granted and overlook its power. It is so seamlessly, uh, sorry, it so seamlessly underpins everything we do that it can be hard sometimes to detect its daily revolutionary influence. So history matters, which is what I've got up there. How we do history, how we think history. This is uh, Gordon Bennett. Uh, this is a, a, a detail from one of his paintings. He's showing Captain Arthur Phillips, 1788, showing up and he has a black boy over there bringing in the drinks. Gordon Bennett is an Indigenous Australian. He was, uh, he's been rethinking through visual image um, the colonial, early colonial moments, James Cook doing his stuff and all that sort of thing. Uh, there are lots of artists, Indigenous artists doing that, not just in Australia. There, there are amazing ones working in, in North America, Central and South America. I'm not sure about New Zealand, but I'm sure they're there doing the same thing, right? So the, the, the point is, is that there is a way of you can go back and you can reclaim histories plural i mean listen to a really great podcast on this with uh, indigenous people from california reclaiming their coastal histories uh, through lineage and through place and space and memory and so on so for me it's about saying well history matters and so we're doing history because it's important and what is it? The essence of good history is this balance. Well, what's the balance? So here is a double, so it's continuing on page nine again. The double historical quest is to astonish us. Wow, that's so amazing. They built the Colosseum or that amazing place, Gobeto Tepe. And to understand, understanding, how do we understand what it was that made Romans laugh or whatever? You know, it's, it's about understanding that that's what the historian's quest is. That's why we're not after answers. Two plus two equals, that's not understanding. You can teach your kids all sorts of stuff, mathematical rules, but if they don't grasp the fact that math is actually about physical things, 
they're always going to be missing something. I've seen this because I used to teach maths, okay? Um, so, this, so that's the tension at the heart of the historical enterprise, the tension between the past as familiar. Oh, I recognise, we all laugh, the Romans laughed, you know, we all like a beer, so the guys at Gobekli Tepe were smashing back a beer, you know, that sort of thing. We can, we can feel some sort of relationship there. We can see when we unearth uh, burial sites and so on, a mother cradling her child or something like that. We can see that there were intimate, family-loving relationships. We can say, yeah, I recognise that. Okay, so that's a familiar, the continuous. Okay, it's from then till now. We can say, yes, there's something there. And also the past is a strange place and therefore able to widen our understanding. Okay, so it's strange. It's unfamiliar. Something about the past even if you just go back half a century in Australian history, it's a different place. Australia in the 1970s, flaky compared, you know, it's, it's really interesting. You remember a bit of the 70s, perhaps young whippersnapper. Uh, but, you know, the, the point is that that Australia, the Australia of Gough Whitlam, these goofy politicians wandering around, you know, and we now got, you know, the descendants of Gough Whitlam in, in Parliament at the moment. Oh my God. Now, will they stop wearing fucking suits? <laughs> no, they're, they're so business like and precise. It's just, you know, it makes a nonsense of some things. The larrikin side of Australian history is sort of being decapitated. So there's a world there that we can always go to to explore things. That's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I kept. Yep bring stuff, uh, stuff out of this, right, these national geos. There's a world there that you can just be a voyeur, a happy voyeur, going around and looking at things. Oh, look at that. There's somebody's shrunken head. <laughs> or there's, you know, they, they used to do this. Oh, wow, they did that. The history of the hot dog, did you like that? You can do a history of anything. Are you looking at me blankly? History of the hot dog? Yes, it was read by some of you at least. Did you go and get a hot dog afterwards? Just savour that sort of thing. Oh, yes, we love hot dogs. Everything has a history. I'm really interested in the history of food, history of cheeses and breads, ferment, fermented things especially. Get me. The first thing I ever got drunk on was my own Viking mead. Uh -huh. That was only 12. My father thought it was very funny. But, you know, I made this special mead uh, because I wanted to see how it worked. Okay. And it did work. <laughs> So that's, that's the point. So this course starts with the universe, you know, this beautiful universe out there. I was walking, uh, I'm walking to raise funds for um, mental health at the moment. I've got to walk 100K this month and I've done about 80 something. All right, so I was out there last night walking in the dark because I didn't get finished my jobs until then. So I was looking at the stars and the clear the sky was clear. It's fantastic. You can, uh, you feel at home, but you... Uh, I'm always in wonder, you know, of the stars at the same time. So from the point of view of order, our galaxy is simple. This is a Christian take, right? David Christian. A star is also a simple structure. Living organisms, even amoeba, by complex are, are, are complex structures. And high levels of complexity require high levels of energy. Straight out of a David Christian sort of book, big history. That's the way it works. And they're not wrong. A star is simple. It might be big, might be hot, but what's it doing? What is a star doing? Does anyone remember? Those scientists up the back? No? It's taking hydrogen, burning it, and turning it into helium. Okay? And, you know, that, that's a slow process. It takes a, a number of billion years. So our star is... I'm just thinking about six, five and a half um, billion years old. Planet Earth started forming around it about a billion years later. And it was able to start hosting very simple organic life around three and a half billion years ago. Okay. And that was after some major cataclysms like being hit by another planetoid and so on. So. What does Eric Chasson have to say? He's the bloke who gave the sort of conceptual structure that David Christian's drawing on. He says, each of us is the product of many ancestral life forms. 
unlike we're all stardust, isn't it? A cluster of genes inherited from all of them and shaped partly by environments that are partly ours, partly our parents, partly our parents, parents, and so on, far back through time. So it's interesting, there's a cumulative thing. You're, we all are the cutting edge of human evolutionary history at this moment, okay? All the issues that we have going on within our bodies are responding to various forces in the world around us. Everything from, did you drink Coke for, uh, for breakfast or did you have a coffee? Did you have good healthy water and whatever it might be. The choices we make determine what our, happens to our genes, the way our body responds over time cumulatively to those things. Of course, we have kids, whatever, some of us at least, those kids inherit perhaps a, a stronger gene for Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know, but they're also inheriting cultural things. If they've seen us drinking Coke all our, all our adult lives as our kids, they will grow up to drink Coke. We get brand associations. Just like if some of you are of a religious nature and you go to church or whatever, that ritualized, repetitive sort of stuff also gets deeply into you. All right? Very interesting. So that's that. So this is where we start, you know. So we're looking at collective learning. So we've got natural selections of genes, learning, collective learning, uh, the means. Right? So we've got something else happens. With collective learning, it's when language appears, symbolic language, as David Christian called it there. The ability to say, not just there are a bunch of buffalo over there, well, let's go and hunt them, but I, I love you, I care. Things that are less tangible, but carry deep meaning. And of course, then I can say to you, this is the way I made my Viking lead and I can tell you what I did. Then you can go home remembering that and do it yourself. I pass that on to you. Okay. So that's the, that, that's the way symbolic language works. It encodes meaning. Got to move this now. I always see favoring the other side. So the planet is our context. So without, with the exception of sunlight, all the energy on the planet is contained in what we call the biosphere that living rim around the edge planet. So no matter how lonely our planet may be, again, I'm harking to those early David Christian ones, because this actually is a remake of, of an earlier slide from a past lecture. So no matter how lonely this planet is, from our perspective, we're not insignificant, which is kind of what David Christian was trying to say in that very first article. Who remembers the first article so long ago, right? Yeah. All right, so humanity exists within this closed system. Okay, we, we have got Elon Musk wanting to send stuff off to Mars and, and that sort of stuff. We're flying spacecraft into asteroids now, aren't we? Or was it a comet, something like that we did a few months ago? You know, so we're playing around with coming out here. Certainly, the, the, as with everything, if you've ever been to a beach in Southeast Asia, you know it's covered with plastic. You know, the, the outside, the stratosphere of the planet is filled with space junk. So we're, we're littering not just the beaches, we're littering the, the very outside of the, of the planet as well, the exterior. So the point is, though, the main point for this idea is that the planet is a system of interacting forces. Talked about it long ago in one of those lectures, hydrosphere, biosphere, technosphere, and so on. But it's a closed system, with the exception that we can, and this is where solar power and all those sorts of things come in, we are continually getting energy from the sun, our closest star. So this is a textual map of the David Christian slash Chasson thing. We've got the particle epoch, the galactic, the stellar, the planetary, the chemical, the biological, the cultural. David Christian has added, we're living now in an industrial epoch. And the, some big historians um, talking about what's called threshold nine. Across from Big Bang to here, the particle epoch, simplicity fleeting, we, uh, threshold one, threshold two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right? So there's a conceptual map that the big historians use. And it, it if, if this was a real big history course, 
and like at Macquarie Uni where David Christian still teaches and lectures, I think. He must be close to retirement now. You know, they spend the half of the semester before human beings even appear. We got, so it's around here that they, the course actually shifts to look at some of what, you know, is happening with the cultural, because this is what traditional history is focused on, right? The cultural, yes? Got to get that light out of my eyes. So you're, you're happy with that? You understand that? But, you know, for big historians, they want to illustrate the processes of energy and complexity by looking at the way they play out up to here. Collective learning only kicks in here. He is. It was just before they really started coining the term. So 2003, that article, his book, Maps of Time, is where big history starts to be talked about as a very specific kind of history. So the main thing is, if it's useful, use it. If it doesn't work because, like Amber, who had to go because she had some kind of other class, when, if you're studying art, big history is only so useful because you need art history, you need a whole bunch of other histories, you might say, versions of the discipline to actually be able to do that. Does that make sense? So I find David Christian stuff really useful because it tells me something that was left out of the way I learned history when I was young, okay? But I can't commit to it as the only way of doing history or the most interesting way. I'm still interested in the other versions of doing history as well, okay? And you can tell that because that's the way I teach this course, right? So we've got evolution of hominids. So interesting. Um, there are a number of links underneath these slides. I haven't put them up yet, but I'll put the slides up for you. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the last five years around the story of the spread of hominids around the world. No longer are they saying that Homo sapiens only developed in the Rift Valley of Africa, more dispersed. Also, no longer are they saying that we left Africa around 60 to 65,000 years ago, there were different phases of dispersion, for instance. It seems, according to the archaeological evidence, and as this paleontological, in other words, that means the early history of human evolution, they've found skeletons in southeast China uh, of homo, homo sapiens that go back 135,000 years now. So it's totally blown out of the water. The simple story that I used to tell five, ten years ago when we were doing this stuff. Okay. But this really captures the kind of increasing complexity of our understanding of the evolution of a species, our species. So um, it's important that to understand though that history is is very us centric, right? Uh, what we have is divergence between our and the bonobos and the chimpanzees ancestors about six and a half million years ago or so. That's when we split off the hominids. We've got a new form of text, genetics. Very interesting. One of the extra readings, uh, if you've ever had the courage to go and look at them, uh, is, a, is a book by Nicholas Wade, The Dawn of Time. He's a science journalist and he gives a really good overview of some of the stuff that's been happening in genetic uh, probing into early human uh, evolution. We've got the role of the environment, of course. Um, so epigenetics, that's the environmental impact on your genes. So my talking about drinking Coca-Cola is not just me being facetious or silly, but it's, you know, if, if we expose our bodies to certain things, um, anybody here lactose intolerant or gluten intolerant? Okay. That's because your genes have not yet caught up with the fact that 10,000 years ago or so, European people started consuming milk products, for instance, or glutens and so on. Before that, 
hunter gathering people didn't drink the milk from a, an animal, they ate the meat from the animal. And they didn't go out and sort of make bread from flour because they weren't cultivating grains yet. Does that make sense? So um, just trying to think which one it was. One of the readings we used to have was on the, um, the evolution of lactose intolerance and gluten intolerance. I'm looking at you guys. Do you remember? Yeah, exactly. Could it be? No, it wasn't. No, I know it was. The guy who wrote the book on co-evolution. Oh, Russell. Russell, yeah. Russell, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so Russell, and I'm pretty sure he, his book is in the extra. So if, you, if you're if you interested in wh where is it that, you know, these things in our genes, because most people from an Asian background, most people from an Indigenous background are lactose intolerant and often gluten intolerant because Chinese people, for instance, they didn't consume milk until Europeans showed up. It wasn't part of their culture. Certainly it wasn't part of Indigenous Māori or Australian culture and so on. You know, what are you going to go? Milk a tea, kiwi or something. <laughs> Brings up really weird visions in my mind. So, yeah. So, what am I saying here? So, yeah, hominids involve, evolved in Africa. That's pretty clear. Uh, there is more genetic diversity in a single African village. That's really interesting. You think genetic diversity has a spread, but actually it's not. A site of origin for genetics is where there's the most diversity of genes. There is more difference between the genome of a slug in one valley, um, the Blackhall Ranges, and the genome of a slug from another valley, then there is genetic diversity amongst all of us human beings outside of Africa. That's really staggering to think that. We, we are a remarkably homogenous species, despite the fact that, you know, there are people of different ethnicities, people of colour, whatever we want to call ourselves, but, you know, however we want to, whatever labels we want to use, you know, it's, it's, it makes us think. So one of the things, and that comes up next, does it, or not? Yeah. So we have technology. So technology is that thing that helps us do something better than we could do in the absence of it. So around 3 million years ago, our ancestors, Homo erectus and co, started using Homo habilis. They started using some stone tools. We have examples of other creatures using tools as well. Chimpanzees will use sticks to get ants out of things. Um, birds have been known to pick up clams and drop them so that they can get into them uh, and eat the, the flesh from inside. You know, so there are all sorts of things happening there. And then around one million years ago, I'm going to touch on that in, in another slide, our second technology, first technology was stone, the second technology was fire. And then, of course, 12,000 years ago, we have the beginning of domestication and agriculture, as we know. Okay, so that's interesting. I've got to keep an eye on time. Because I'm... So now, look at that fire already. So fire is the second technology. It affects our diet. That, in turn, affects the evolution of our bodies, just like drinking Coke makes your brain smaller. Eating bison that's been cooked makes your brain bigger. So the effect of fire on our diet and then on our physiology was huge. It really amplified the ability of the brain to function. And the brain, of course, as the language sensor, led to you know, increasing complexities of all kinds. That's a possibility. Um, yeah, but they, would, they didn't know about cleaning water. So um, the average lifetime of a human being before the New Stone Age was around 35 years maximum. Some people would live into their 50s and 60s, but they would be very few. And many people died in their teens and early 20s. So I don't know whether fire changed that or not. I certainly haven't read that it's done so. I'm going to keep moving. So we're thinking fire. Um, I can't think genes without thinking about this guy, um, Spencer Wells. 
he's the guy that ran the genographic project and we used that project in the early years of this course for about six or seven years i gene, gene test three different people um i would have captured uh you uh maori uh, new zealander i would have captured you because i would love to see what your genes had to say and i would have got some typical you know white person you know nothing personal and i would have found somebody hopefully from central asia or africa or somewhere else or an indigenous australian if we happen to have one in the group like that and and it was spencer wells's project the genographic project that we sent this stuff off to and i gave a little snapshot at the end of one of the last lectures of that if you got around to seeing that of some of the stuff that came from like 2016 17. but you know the point that he's talking about he's very interested in the intersection between again imagination okay and technology the different kinds and the kind of cross fertilization that occurs there and of course he talks about trial and error the other thing he talks about in another quote which i because i knew i was going to use way too many slides um is the fact that fire particularly created a center around which community would gather at night for instance as they were cooking their food they've been out all day or most of them have been sort of asleep under a tree for most of the day they just go and catch something and bring it back type thing but he talked about that as an early social space in which thinking occurred collective learning in other words would accelerate so the story of divergence mapped here in a, uh, an image I got before I was using the Spencer Wells stuff from Josephine Flood, uh, a really good book on Indigenous Australians, looking at the, the um, these are M129 or whatever it is, uh, looking at the genomes that are moving out, but all out from Africa, uh, from the human web. This is from their book. Um, that's McNeil and McNeil, we get this kind of movement again. And all of that movement is introducing us to new environments, which stimulate the brain. Now, I've talked about the brain as, as a thinking thing, but I've made a lot of, placed a lot of emphasis on curiosity, emotions, identity, and so on. So the emotional brain, the brain is highly emotional because it's a chemical soup. All right, chemical soup, I mean, all those hormones and stuff running around there. We've got happy hormones and we've got sad hormones, okay? Um, it's really interesting to look at neurologically the way in which decisions get encoded. But the brain is also, because it's a hormonal soup or a chemical soup, it's easily conditioned, okay? So if, um, uh, if, if you've got a trauma and something comes into your field of vision or perception that's related to that kind of trauma, you will immediately react in certain ways, all right? I think we all know that because I don't think there are many people around who haven't got some form of trauma <laughs> of one kind or another. So what does this mean? Well, it means quite a few things. Um, it means for a start that as historians of the big picture, we need to understand, well, what makes the brain work? I don't need those. The brain's complex it constitutes only two percent of our mass but it uses about 20 percent of our energy okay sucks up uh, three quarters of a liter of blood every minute okay contains a hundred billion synapses okay that's massive it contains 1.3 billion terabytes of storage okay bigger than my computer the worldwide digital storage in 2012, this is one that I only grabbed this slide yesterday, so I didn't update this, is 2.7 billion terabytes. So one human brain is half of that in 2012. I'd love to know what it is now. I've got to go and find that one. The brain is formed in grids. Okay, evolution, first nervous system in the Cambrian worm. We can see that if you look at the um, fossilized remains of a Cambrian worm, scientists can actually identify the grid pattern that still is fun foundational for our own brain, which is really interesting. So we have a little bit of Cambrian worm in you, which is okay. And it contains uh, 160,000 kilometers of white matter. Okay, not to go around the world. So the brain is pretty specialized instrument and it explains why we have politicians. No, don't we? 
it makes you wonder why we have politicians. <laughs> okay, but that's that, that conditioned. That conditioned to worldviews that are anachronistic. Now, you know what that term means? Anachronism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Anachronism means it's no longer sits within, it's not appropriate for that time. If Julius Caesar, if you're acting Julius Caesar and you walk on with sneakers, the sneakers are an anachronism. Thinking that um, fossil fuel is the future, that's anachronism. Okay? It's ana means outside of chronic. Chronism. Chronos. Ah! Okay? He was a pretty hungry guy, but he's also, you know, time. It's about time, time eating things. Think Bilbo Baggins, what's that riddle in the dark? Yeah, really good. So language leads to writing. Funny little scribbling things like that. Uh, I really find cuneiform interesting. When I was lucky enough to visit the um, Louvre in Paris last time, I hunted down Hammurabi Stella and got some person to take a photograph of me standing next to it like an absolute nerd. You know, Hammurabi is the ancient lawgiver of, uh, he was an Assyrian, or was he an Akkadian? I forget. It was one of those early Mesopotamian uh, rulers, but his the first law there, right? So this is really important. We're getting abstraction. The brain, that complex thing, can think abstractly, but that means that we have to say to ourselves, well, what the hell is consciousness? How conscious are we? This is one of those great mm, questions, you know, sort of um, what's the sound of one hand clapping or something like that. There's those sorts of deep questions about what is it that's going on. Language is allowed for the development of an inner world. We can see that. This grew over time from a minimal awareness to abstract thought. Okay, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Began as collective intelligence. You and I sitting around the fire talking about the hunt or whatever, okay? Leading to a journey towards me discovering who I am then. You're you and I'm me. It process of abstraction, that means starting to think abstractly, going from there are six cows over there to I love you or I care or something like that, right? Leads to this theory of this guy who's been dead since the 1990s. He went out of fashion very quickly, but he's come back into fashion in the last decade on the bicameral mind. Camera, click, is actually a, a word for room, okay? Bicameral mind says that the two zones in our brain, not left and right hemispheres so much, but that there's a, a, a zone associated with abstraction and a zone associated with expression of you know, about material realities. There's the cows over there as opposed to I love you or hate you or whatever it might be. So if we go back to this one, there's an inner and outer world grew over time. There, Julian James theory or theorized, hypothesized that all those Greek gods that kept coming down and talking to Odysseus and all these other people during the Iliad and the Odyssey and all those other contexts where people had an invasion from a Greek, from a god of some kind, as they called it, was actually an inner thought speaking to you, your own thought, but you didn't recognise it as your own thought. A very interesting idea. So Odysseus came up with the evil idea of a Trojan horse, but he thought it was Athena. Because Athena was, in, his, in, his, in the way the story is told, it was always Athena, his patron goddess, that was talking to him. Worth thinking about. Worth going and have a look at that little link there. I'm assuming it works. I haven't checked. If it doesn't work, let me know and I'll, set, I'll track it down and send it to you. Um, so what's happening? Energy and complexity, collective learning, you know all about that now, ticking along. So we can understand how the world at one level is being formed and is evolving under the interactions of those three. There's no imagined order until we get to the cultural epoch, which I pointed out, all right? Trade and storytelling, song lines, that's the webs from McNeil and McNeil. We've got cultural processes fertilising, that means interacting, that's homo puppy and um, co-evolution, along with domestication. Uh, we've got weird, we're all weird, okay? 
And uh, to capture the interactive nature, this is from the book Song Lines from Kelly and McNeil. Uh, it's a, an, an Australian Indigenous artist actually created that, but it's in colour and it was hung in the Australian National Gallery. I'm assuming it's still there. So then all of that, see, this is the synopsis of the course. I'm going to, yeah, I've got to keep an eye on that because um, I would like to finish the lecture, but we might run out of time. Yeah, no, maybe. What is civilization? So we've got all those ingredients from the previous page. You know, civilization is a complex something. We can say, well, we, we can recognize it by its elements. Okay, so let's have a look. This guy, I saw this guy in uh, the Louvre too. Okay, Gudea. Um, Lagash was the biggest city on the planet about 4,000 years ago. The whole of the world population was about 27 million around that time. This is, uh, what's his name? Peter, no, um, bum, bum, bum. from Fire to Freud. Who wrote that one? Um, is it Pete Watson? It's Watson. It used to be a reading we had. He, he, his book, Great Ideas or History of Ideas from Fire to Freud, fire being an idea, Freud, hmm. Okay, he wasn't an idea, but he had some interesting ones. Most of us disagree with them now, but they're interesting, especially if you're into psychoanalyzing literature. 27 million people is not many. It's pretty much the Australian population now, if I'm right. But the entire planet only had about 27 million people. Of that, 80,000 lived in Lagash, okay? Um, but the majority experience of the average world person was still that of a hunter-gatherer, or maybe you might be in agriculture. We can see this map here, civilizations. So we've got the Egyptian, we've got the Mesopotamia, and we've got the Harappan. Or this is the Indus Valley civilization. Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Indus Valley civilization because I used to give lots of case studies. So there it is from the air. It looks like a chip almost, you know, a computer chip. Really interesting society, very, very uniform. But there are a couple of things that we don't we don't see here that we see in every other civilization. We don't see hierarchy. We don't see military. No weapons, no skeletons, no maimed people, no illustrations of people being decapitated. You know, the way the pharaohs always going like that and about to smash the, the, the enemy on the head type thing. None of that. No palaces. Some sacred sites in there. They often had temples. Um, very interesting. So Harappa, what can we say? So these are some statistics. It's about 50,000 people in each of its cities. Okay. It really got going around 4,500 years ago, and it came to quite a dramatic end about 3,500 years ago. The dramatic end was it suddenly just stopped being. Um, the Indus Valley, the Indus River moved, and a number of things uh, were going on. And it was very fertile area. It's totally arid now, just like Mesopotamia, but that's because they didn't understand that irrigation was going to salinate and, and wreck the soil. Okay. The bricks and bathrooms. Every organized society going from the very beginning, they seem to have an issue about toilets. They've kept building them and building, you know, um, um, drainage and all that sort of stuff to. Or not because of sanity, because they didn't understand sickness the way we understand it, but obviously because if you've got 80,000 people living in a very small area, it's not going to be very nice unless you can remove all the effluent easily. Bricks, though, bricks, they've got the, the Harappan bricks or the Indus Valley bricks are incredibly accurate in size and weight. Okay, so there was some form, this is what puzzles archaeologists, there was some form of centralised or uh, organize, organising principle, I guess, that ensured that all the bricks were the same. Now, if I flick back for a moment to that, that one, the Indus Valley civilization had trading routes that, by the sea that went across to here. They found those bricks here in the ports where they obviously built their own docks and everything to um, trade between empires, okay? Really interesting. Um, so it collapsed around 1700. Why? 
Well, there are a number of speculated reasons. The main one seems to be that the Indus River itself, which provided them with that water, moved, but also the ground where the soil was increasingly being degraded by the irrigation system that was leading to salination. You know what salination is? Should I explain that? Okay, salination is where you've, you've got, you're in a hot, arid sort of area and you're using water through canals. It goes out into the fields, but it evaporates. And as it evaporates, it leaves small amounts of salt. That's fine five, 10 years. But if you're running the same sort of system for hundreds and hundreds of years, it salinates the soil. And salt in soil is, you know, inhibits plant growth. We can see in the Mesopotamian context, for instance, that the Mesopotamians started off growing wheat, but wheat's quite salt sensitive. After about three or 400 years, they went to barley, which is hardier. It doesn't suffer so much from salt. And ultimately, they, I think there was a third grain there. I'm not sure what it was. And then they basically, the agricultural dimension of Mesopotamia collapsed completely. By the time the Romans, where the Mesopotamians weren't growing much wheat at all, it was the Egyptians. But that's because the Egyptian floodplain from the Nile River was quite different. It was being renewed every year with silt and mud and everything else from uh, down the down river or up river as they would have called it. So one of the interesting things I'm going to go here about the question about religion, because I'm going to touch on religion a little bit more in a moment. You know, this is a seal from the Indus Valley. They seem to disappear, the Indus Valley civilization completely, but a thousand years later, the Hindu religion recognized through the Upanishads, the Vedas, and so on. You've got Shiva. This is a modern Shiva, of course. Recognize anything? <laughs> very, very similar. So there is there's some form of cultural diffusion from the north of India to the south, or to the center and the south. All of that is speculation. Here's a list of things that you can associate with that question of what's the civilization? Hierarchy. All civilizations are violent. Okay, ours is a great example. Cities with monumental architecture, Sydney Harbour Bridge uh, Sydney, and the Sydney Opera House, writing and bureaucracy, organised religion, specialised occupations, complexity, and the accumulation of capital. This is a place where incredible cities are a place where incredible wealth is displayed, usually by an elite. Not that you and I are wealthy, but of course, we are wealthy compared to any ancient person. All right, so we've got to understand that. Um, Cities are generally associated with coercion and hierarchical states, and they're usually patriarchal. Okay, so let's just say some a few things about hierarchy. I've done that with that one. You know, we've got agricultural producers that produce the basic wealth. That's the energy quotient. Energy starts to accumulate in villages, local elites. They start trading, they build cities, and we end up with states or city-states or empires. Okay, hierarchy helps organize complexity, certainly does, but it cuts down choice. That's the trade-off. So in order to maintain security, we often traded freedom, for instance. So what about belief systems? This is slide 35. Yeah, I've got about three more, four more slides, I think. And what is the time? Four to two. If you need to run, do so. But so I wanted to say something at the end about belief systems because imagined orders to me is one of them is a very appealing idea from Harari. I think it, it makes so much sense. So from Peter Stearns, great world historian, contrast must be uh, not monopolized cultural comparisons. So if we're comparing the Egyptians to the Mesopotamians to the Chinese, to indigenous people here or in New Zealand or wherever else across the Pacific, Christians, of course, Christian Europe, Muslims, Hindus. We can't, we shouldn't be looking at, at the differences. We should be looking at the functions. What is the function of religion in organized complex societies? And what is the function of spirituality? And they're not the same. And I'm going to give you a few points on that. Okay. Culture provides security, tells you who you are, and it provides meaning. These are two things that you can say culture does, okay? Um, but I want to move on. 
because of time. Kathleen Kesson, uh, she's a great thinker on this sort of stuff. She's also a great educator, actually. She said that, look, religion serves to codify and sanctify particular spiritual experiences. And because of collective learning and imagined orders, those experiences never just mine. They're always a collective sort of thing. I, I understand. Moses, from the Bible, he saw a burning bush, and out of that bush came a voice. Moses, my lad, you've got to go and do this, right? So those sorts of annoying things that happen to people when you're wandering around in the desert, not drinking for a long time, you start hallucinating or whatever. But it, within Moses's worldview or frame of reference, his imagined order, this was God talking to him. It was one of those bicameral mind things, maybe. Or maybe God does appear in burning bushes to some people who have very long beards. Okay, so codify and sanctify, that means to make sense of, especially those that serve social needs for order, continuity and stability. Religion is a social product that has helped most complex societies manage their realities and their peoples. Elites particularly are invested in that, managing the peoples, so that we share something together. Those myths from Rome or Gilgamesh or wherever they might come from, they're all about telling people how to behave. What is a good citizen? To be a good Christian. What did Jesus say? Pay your taxes, right? Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Yes, bring a look at anybody around here for some form of affirmation. God. Um, it's quite funny, really, in a tragic way. The important distinction here, though, is between spirituality as dynamic. It's something that you and you experience. But it's not something that we experience collectively. As soon as you start giving it voice, you'll frame it as the angels came and spoke to me or God spoke to me through a burning bush or whatever it is, and it becomes a social product. Spirituality, though, is something different. And Kesson, I think, it's a, no, we talk, that's right, this guy, he's first. There's Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu is the great Chinese sage. Not sure if he ever existed, none of us are, but certainly his book, The Tao Te Ching, is well worth reading. Yearnings, okay? So spirituality is about what we yearn for. We yearn for meaning, for connectedness, okay? That can be material, I yearn for more, oh, I need another BMW, okay? Or I yearn for more, I need a new wife or a new husband. That sort of thing, it can be relational, but it's a yearning that, you know, for wherever we are, there's always something calling us to come out, go beyond ourselves. And that's, in these guys' terms, that's the spiritual. That aspect of human consciousness and will that yearns towards meaning and purpose and connectedness. I really like that, and connectedness, because to me, so much of our reality, unconsciously, we're talking about the way um, technologies or objects influence, we are co-created. And we, we often, in our world, we don't have a language for that because I have this and I can see that that object is outside of me. I'm not in relation to, I can pick it up, I can take it home or I can whack it on the table and dent it. You know, I can do things too. It's an object. Nature is an object in our Western material world. But in a world of connectedness, it becomes different. Okay, and that's really important. Second last slide, third last sometime. So this is really good. I'm, I, if we, if I'd had another hour to regale you, I could have talked at length about this. This is really interesting. Have a look at this. If you're interested, I think I still have the PDF of the article somewhere. This is a book chapter. I, actually, I've got the book somewhere, unless I lent it to somebody, which is always a risk. But, you know, um, this is what we're having a look at. Looking at what does religion and what is about spirituality? One of the things, let's look at religion is conformist. We all go to church, we all kneel and bow and, and so on. We sing hymns. The guy up the front, or woman now occasionally, he tells us stories. Whereas this one's self-creative. So one's about conforming to a social order, the other's not. I would recommend that you spend some time looking at that. It's really, really interesting because I think a lot of people confuse spirituality and religion. Okay, and I think you, we need to separate them. I have time for both, but, you know, uh, that's, to me, religion is really interesting. 
and the aesthetics of religion are really interesting, but that would be another whole course, you know. So, yeah, it's no accident. This is the second last slide, I think. What is it? Yep. Um, the no accident that in an age uh, that universal religions appear at the time that the great empires emerge. So these coloured splotch there are the great empires. They're the sites where universal religions appear. Before that, you worship the local tree. There was a local nymph or a god who lived in the stream or whatever it might have been. You know, it was very local in particular. Whereas Christianity emerged in the Roman Empire, where the empire gave them a vision of the universal. Does that make sense? Same for China, same for India, and so on. So we end with revolutions. I hope you're all going to be revolting in the next uh, few years as you study, be thinking, and so on. This is just a list of the revolutions that you could say cumulatively in the last three centuries have led to where we are today. And I want to... Oh, that one snuck in somehow. Uh, that one doesn't matter. This is the one I wanted to finish with. Oops, where am I? Oh, look at that. i got a whole bunch more there. Don't worry about them. I like, this is where I wanted to go. I thought I'd done 40. And we used to do 60 to 70 in a two-hour lecture, but obviously I've got more loquacious with my old age. Um, what I want you to be aware of is that I want you to remember to learn I want you to question always, especially annoying people like me. Don't accept answers. Be curious. Keep on exploring. And if, and this is really important. What you believe and aspire to, make sure it aligns with your actions. Do what you think and feel is right and, and so on. Okay? Don't let some other old codger or young codger tell you what to do. You, you, we all have our moral and ethical compass. Listen to it, nurture it, and act accordingly. All right? So I want to thank you so much for coming along. I hope that was, you haven't run away, so that's always a good sign. Um, and, you know, you know where to find me. You can always email me. Gil and Caitlin are here if you because most of you must belong to them. I, I managed to get rid of all my tutoring people mostly, except for you. You're a true believer. Um, so, yeah, thank you and farewell. That's the end if you didn't realise that. Thing. Look at that. I've forgotten all about those last ones. All right, so I've got to stop recording for you guys. Stop recording.